Welcome back to Art of the Float. Before we get started, I want to just give a big thanks to our sponsors. Helmbot, thank you so much for supporting the show, making sure that we're able to produce an episode nearly every week of the year and provide value to the float industry. Thank you so much. From the bottom of our hearts, we truly appreciate you and your support. Um, Helmbot, if you're not aware, is developing software that is designed specifically for float centers, but it's not just a scheduling software for your customers. It's also scheduling for your employees. It's, I mean, one of my favorite things is task manager so that your employees don't have to keep in mind all the things to do. You don't need to have a piece of paper or a separate document somewhere on your computer for all the tasks. Alerts pop up automatically to say, uh, you know, with different cleaning tasks for the float tank, setting up your float center. And we even, we, you can expand the task and see de more detail-oriented instructions within that for how to accomplish those tasks. So if you forget how to check hydrogen peroxide levels, those instructions are right there. I, I can't recommend Helmbot enough, but don't take my word for it. Check them out yourself, helmbot.com. Uh, schedule a tour. Have them, walk, uh, you th have them walk you through it and make sure that it's a good fit for you. There's absolutely no risk. Also, a big thank you to Isopod. We appreciate you so much as well. I-SOPOD.com is where you want to go to check out these beautiful float tanks that are incredibly spacious and they're built incredibly well. I think I talk about that every single time because it's such a um, important aspect of owning a float tank is, you know, aesthetics are, are wonderful and you want them to be super friendly looking for your customers looking at them. But when you're doing maintenance or I guess just over years and years as degradation occurs, you want pieces of material and a tank built that is going to withstand aging and isopod is built just with that in mind so again i-sopod.com is where you want to go we've got a really fun episode for you here a really cool episode with carolyn joining us talking about leadership uh, a really good one I, I hope we get to have her on again soon please enjoy the show Welcome back to another episode of Art of the Float, where float centers thrive. My name is Dylan. I own the float shop in Portland, Oregon, and I hate to just start out with a really cheesy note here, but if we're talking about the people I'm inspired by and who I find uh, are great leaders and who I look towards, it is people within the float industry, and honestly, it's very specifically people... It's my co-host, <laughs> and, and Kim, you are one of the people I absolutely adore and... and uh, when I'm trying to visualize what to do, you are what comes up. And I will say that's outside of, uh, also outside of simply leadership. That's also has to do with organization, multitasking. You're just, you're, you're pretty amazing, Kim. And Drew, you were also just so cool. I know. Nifty. Drew, yeah, Drew, let's, <laughs> I'm like, should I cut my hair? What would Drew do? That's what I'm thinking I about with Drew. Drew. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> We don't this do is, any edits anymore. No edits, edits. Nothing gets cut. Yeah. I thought we were going boy, girl, boy, girl, but we decided not to. It's okay. Do, it's okay. New, new Hampshire float. <laughs> and we're talking about leaders. And um, I personally like to see people doing. And I like to know that people have done and not just talk about doing. So mm -hmm. for me, I respond to people who have been through it have a proven track record and can speak on that versus they've never done it, but are going to speak about it. And I like to see people rolling up their sleeves and getting in the trenches. And that's a guy I'm going to follow into the foxhole and I'll have your back. If you'll have mine. Is that, is that a lady too? Guys and ladies you'd follow in the foxhole? Yeah, I use, I'm old. I'm old. So I use the word guy. <laughs> I know it's 2022. I need to stop saying guys. But yes, when I say guys, I mean females, males, anyone who doesn't identify as either. It's a general people, but I know I need to start getting away from the word guys. Thank you, Carolyn, for pointing that out. Yeah, me too. I, I totally relate. Uh, just uh, I, I'm working on it myself. We'll All introduce right, that and... specter, that ghostly boss later. Yes. <laughs> and Sorry. I am no, no. Kim Hannon. I own Sukino Float Center in Salt Cave in Southern Indiana with my husband. And I have had a couple of really great leaders, but I think one that stands out the most to me is someone who um, really cared about me as an individual 
um, more than just me as an employee. And I think um, whenever I think about this leader, it was absolutely like life changing to work with her. Um, and I am incredibly excited that she's here tonight. And we'll talk a lot more about what makes a great leader. But um, my old boss from the corporate world, um, from whenever that was, 2000. Nine uh, for a few years after that, and uh, my boss is here with us because <laughs> she taught me so much of what I know. So Dylan, to to hear you say that you admire me, a lot of that reflects on her as well because I learned so much from working from uh, working with Carol. And so, uh, incredibly excited and grateful to have you here tonight to to join oh. like my old world into my new. Like this is one of those moments that's just like oh, my heart is so full just seeing you guys all together. So. Yay. Thank you. Well, this is Super absolutely cool. my pleasure. So thank you so much for asking me and for all those kind words. That means so much yes. to me, Kim. You know that. I love you. I love Carolyn. you. Oh. Carolyn, we're live, guys. Show. We're live. Thank you. We are. <laughs> I love you guys, too. <laughs> thank you for being here. We, we truly oh, appreciate it. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about your, I mean, we've heard a little bit from Kim's point of view, but can you tell us a little about your point of view of this corporate world that you came from and how were you fitting into that that corporate world? Well, that's a very interesting story. So um, my uh, I did not set out to be in the corporate world. In fact, my um, original training was horticultural therapy and landscape architecture. And so um, I actually was working in psychiatric rehab initially, working with adults with chronic mental illness, teaching them floristry and landscaping, um, as a way of uh, teaching job skills to get them either into the uh, workforce for the first time or um, back to the workforce. And it was during that that I really started to feel um, really passionate about what motivates people, you know, at work and how do you align people's passion with the the needs of the business. And so that's when I started to shift to more of an HR world and how, how could I... Um, work in a, in a way that would make work great for people. And some of it was because I remember growing up hearing my parents complain about their bosses. And I always wanted to be a man. Like, I think the role of manager is one of the most important roles in someone's life because mm-hmm. you have such a significant impact on another person's well-being and their growth and their future. And so I've always dreamed about having that role and being the best that I could be, but also wanting to create environments where that uh, relationship between a manager and an employee shines. So that's when I left psychiatric rehab and went to the corporate world, starting at the bottom and then just worked my way up, um, getting another degree um, to you know make sure I knew what the rules were. But it was really my passion about making work great for people is what kind of fueled me to move forward. All right. <laughs> And then when did that, when did, when did Kim come into that picture? Wow. So I started in corporate America in uh, 2001, so 2001. And then Kim, you came into my world or we connected. Uh, What was that? 2007 or eight? So we actually, I knew who she was before she knew who I was because we were actually in a leadership development workshop together. And so um, our company had this really big leadership program that was, you know, a huge experience. And it was an honor to get to be invited into this program. And on the very last day of the program, um, of course, you know, they'd invited people to share a little bit about what they'd gotten out of the week and all of that. And Carolyn stood up and was sharing her story. And I was sitting like way across the room. And I remember just listening to her speak. And I was just drawn to her. I was like, I don't know who this woman is, but like, I felt really, really connected to her. And as she shared her story, I was just like, wow, like, she's just one of those people that I need in my life. And then we didn't actually meet until several years later. Um, Our department, she was in Chicago in the headquarters and I worked at our regional office in Orlando and our department was going through some reorganizational stuff. And um, I didn't know at the time, but I was kind of being scoped out to join the team in Chicago. And Carolyn did finally fly down and uh, we went up to dinner and had an interview and I didn't know that it was really oh, wow. like, well, I had no idea what was really happening. I had just come back <laughs> from maternity leave. And so I was just like, wow. I don't know what's going on. Like, 
we're reorganizing and all of this. And we went out to dinner and just had this amazing conversation and talked about, you know, what we could do together and um, just really connected. And while we were at that dinner that night, it dawned on me, like, why I felt so connected to her and who she was. And I was like, we were in this program together and I remember you from that. And, you know, it was just an instant, like, this is going to be amazing kind of thing. And it really was for several years, just truly amazing. Um, You know, Carolyn has this kind of covert way of wanting to change culture and to impact culture um, without necessarily saying, hey, guys, this is what we're trying to do. It wasn't a big, bold thing, but it was very stealth and like really trying to help (laughs) shift the the organization. And it it was we kind of talked about some of the stealth things we were doing, but, you know, we we were intentional about it, but it didn't need to be this blanket like, hey, company, we're changing our policy and we're changing the way we show up. And, you know, we're trying to be more intentional about things. And it, it wasn't like that because, like, really, corporations don't operate in that way. Yeah. And it <laughs> was. It. This is already sounding yeah. very different than my experience in the corporate world. Yes. <laughs> and so. it was a very quiet um way of just how she inspired people to really show up and give their best selves and okay, okay that was right, right. we amazing. got it we got to pump the brakes here real quick i i want more <laughs> biography i want to know where this went but i also need to know carolyn what were you doing that she was seeing what was the stealth work that you're doing to inspire people in the workplace because i i want to be able to do that or at least i want to be able yeah. to put the grain of that yeah you know? yeah so you know one thing uh, i learned um many years ago through a program that I took uh, in, in terms of leadership development um, is, you know, when you go and talk to people about what you have learned or what you know or what you're trying to do, people don't listen to you in the same way as if, um, as if uh, they don't listen to you in the same way than if you were to just represent what you are trying to achieve. So, for example... I knew that we were trying to change, um, you know, how people saw other people or how we approached learning or how we approached employee um, engagement or culture. And the way to do that is not to tell people like this is what you need to do. It is like to to you have to walk the talk. You have to demonstrate the behaviors and you have to like um bring people on kind of moment by moment and step by step and interaction by interaction so that they feel the trust because the trust and the faith that you create in a relationship with your employees is everything when it comes to creating that sustainability, knowing that the path that you're going on is going to remain. Does that make sense? I think so, but I think I, I have a few. <laughs> I think we might need yeah, to go into that. Yeah, ask away. Other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess, um, honestly, one thing that's coming up for me just while you're talking is the fact that we have a manager at our business. And that's not true for, you know, everybody in the industry. And yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily true for Drew if, if your employee is considered a manager or not. But um, having that effect through your man, like part of me is just I'm taking what you're saying and saying, thinking like, how do I have that influence through, I don't know, like a reverse funnel, if you will, like Mm -hmm, from the top mm -hmm. down. Um, But I don't even know if that's necessarily the next question to ask because I think you unpacked a lot. But I think that that is actually a very good question to ask. And and the the phrase that I want to share is the the whole idea of servant leadership. And that's really where I base my foundation in everything is that, you know, you could look at the person at the top as the person who um, has all the answers, that knows everything, that is like leading the pack. Or you can look at the person at the top who is is um, listening to everybody around them and identifying the opportunities and then championing all of them to like be their best selves and to like, um, like hold them up to a higher level. And, and if that's the case, in my opinion... When you're a servant leader and you're doing that, all of them are going to rise to the occasion and like push everybody forward, if that makes sense. So you're, you are, your job is not as a leader to necessarily tell everybody what to do, is to listen and to understand who they are and what their vision is um, and what their visions are and, and, and really encourage them to be their best selves and to... Um, have them just share that and, and 
take risks and, and support them in that. And always great things come. And I think with Kim, um, she will tell you there were times, you know, when I would just be like, just, you know, it doesn't matter what's been done before. Like right now, like I want you to come up and I would not always tell, I would not say, I want you to do it this way. I would be like, here's where we're going to achieve. That. Yeah. And you can like achieve it any way that you want to. And mm-hmm. I will support you. Just help me understand what you're doing. And um, that that's really engaging for people because it gives them a sense of ownership in the outcome as opposed to, Kim, here's the thing I need you to do and I want you to do it this way. Then it's like you're just following direction. It's not as inspiring. Right. And I think one of the tangible ways that that showed up too is a, a phrase that Carolyn said so frequently um, what can I do to help you? What can I do to support you? What's standing in your way? And she would, every time we would have a status meeting or touch base on, you know, projects that we were working on, I would tell her all this stuff and she would simply ask like, what can I do to support you in this? You know, and that was just such a simple phrase, but it was so powerful, you know, to, to realize like she has my back and she's going to support me in all of this. And that's something that I've carried forward, you know, with all of my direct reports, um, since then that like, it's a constant communication of what can I do to support you? Like, and it it opens up the, you know, freedom of expression for people to really care about what they're doing. What she was saying, that sense of ownership is just huge. And, you know, realizing that as a leader, your job sometimes is just to get stuff out of the way for people and let them do their job. And on the flip side, or maybe not the flip side, but on the other hand, Kim, the other thing was to let you let go of perfection, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I don't know if you know that Kim is a struggle. recovering, <laughs> Kim is a recovering perfectionist. And so myself included, but because she would want so much for something to be so perfect before she shared it, or she, um, you know, allowed it to release, you know, it was like, your good is amazing. And we're going to let you let go because the, the, you know, what you do to yourself like that. And that's where I think the care comes in as a manager is like, you care so much about your final product, but I care about you as an individual and the final product is perfect as it is. And I know you're always going to see opportunity, but I see it as perfect right now. And I'm more concerned about you taking care of you than the Hmm. final product. If that makes sense. I think so. I, I have the questions, but I think Drew has one here. Yes. I have a few. Okay. Now, all right. I hear everything you're saying. I think it all makes sense. With float centers, typically we're dealing with a um, relatively low-paying job, mm-hmm. not a job somebody is doing as a career, part-time mm-hmm. people, or maybe a stepping stone towards something else. I would put the turnover rate at a float center at 100% for anyone who is not an owner. And we're living in a time where um, you have this um, like revolution for employees who want more to do less and think they deserve it, regardless if they have the resume to back it up or the experience or not. So one of my struggles has been giving back to the employees and them not taking advantage of it. And so how do you lead in a space where there's really like, what's the long-term future for someone working at a flow center, right? Like you can work for, maybe you get a manager, but generally speaking, you're not going to like raise a family on working at a float center unless you're an owner. I don't know what type of manager at a float center is making like family providing money, right? Mm-hmm. So it, this is in my mind, maybe the others have a different a different perspective, but I see it as it's short term. They're coming in, they're coming out, they're, you know, they're going to leave. So how do you lead and get the most out of someone who is making decent money, but not like life-changing money and um, trying to give them um, – enough and motivate like I I guess maybe I'm not even sure what my question is but to lead and to try to get people to give you the value even though Mm -hmm. you both kind of know it's like Mm -hmm. "Ah, I want you to do good at my business but also I can't I can't give you $20 an hour 
I can't give everyone at my float shop mm -hmm. $20 an hour. So yes. like you were saying, you get kind of get what you pay for. If you're paying $10 an hour, you get $10 an hour's worth of work. So as a leader, I find that as a challenge to, Absolutely. you know, keep it, that motivation going and you can only give mm -hmm. so much as a float center with a limited budget. Right? Absolutely. And so what I'll say to that are a couple things. One is, um, you are limited and it's very, uh, um, um, helpful and strategic to be aware of what the turnover is going to be in your business. There are some businesses where that is just a fact and that's something that you just have to manage. And then how you minimize the cost of the turnover is really where you're, where you kind of help to make ends meet. The other part of that, the second thing is what I want to say is every person wants to feel that they're important and they're valued. So it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what level of employee you are. Um, every person in the world wants to know that when they put their effort into something, that it matters and that they are uh, valued for who they are. And if there are some great perks that come along the way, that's great. You know, and especially, of course, people want to have a bigger salary. But I promise you, salary is not the driver of engagement. The, what's what's the driver engagement is that people feel cared for, that their manager is going to listen to them and help them be successful, give them the flexibility that they need in their life, you know, to both serve the business and their life outside of that. Um, and that they have an environment where they feel safe and they have, you know, the tools that they need to do their job. So it's not the money in money and benefits, obviously, they're, but they're, they're just, they're sort of like a stake in the ground. They're not, they're not what actually engages people. And all the studies around engagement show that. When you do any kind of engagement survey, compensation is always the lowest rated thing. And that's because people always think they get paid more, they need to be paid more. The reality is people don't understand how compensation decisions are figured out and like how they're determined. And so the transparency around that is actually what's going to help engage people. But more so, it is knowing that the energy that I'm putting into this effort matters to other people around me. It makes a difference to this business. Therefore, I want to come to work each day because people value me. I, not that I should be taking up any time, even any kind of advice or anything, but uh, I'm a big Trekkie. And in the Star Trek universe, there's no more money. And everybody working there, it's not, has nothing to do with what they're getting back. It's because they're interested in what they're doing and everybody's engaged with what they're doing. And they're part of this tribe because of that. And that I feel like what you're describing, like that sounds like what's happening. hundred percent. Utopia, 100%, which right. I've bumped up against that philosophy many times of like, is that actually the motivator? Or like if everybody had a, a base income, basic income, would, would they, would there still be motivation to work? And I, and I think there would be people. The, the other thing that was coming up for me was how important hiring is of people who mm -hmm. naturally have a spark where they want to engage with the world as opposed to just kick back. Because I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong and you could inspire those people, but I feel like there are people who would really just prefer to put their feet up and hammer a paycheck. Um, but that I think they're also easy true. to spot. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that's the difference between employee satisfaction and employee engagement, right? And employee satisfaction is something where people can be very satisfied with their work environment. It doesn't mean they're going to put in extra effort. It doesn't mean mm. they're going to go beyond what's expected and like put that passion into it. Engagement is where they feel really connected to the outcome of the business and they want to put all the effort in that they can to make sure it's successful. And I'll say that when it comes to hiring, you know, my recommendation is always to hire on the um, like the values that are necessary for that job. And I'll tell you, I hired Kim. I hired other people on my team who didn't have the experience of doing what I needed them to do. They had the passion and the positive energy and like the the enthusiasm. And I hired them and I and I was like, you know what, we're going to make it work and I'm going to train you do whatever I need to do. And I will tell you, I've never had an employee quit on me. I've never had an employee fail on me. And it's because I just always championed them because they saw it from themselves. And I said, okay, I will help you make that happen. So what if an employee, like you say, you are fully empowered. This is your job to take on. And, and you know, ideally you're still supporting them along the way and doing check-ins so they're not like, you know, totally just giving themselves yeah, a rope. Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, but the final result is they, they turn it in or it's 
public facing, whatever, it goes out and you're kind of like, mm, that kind of cringy, like, ooh, this isn't on brand for my business or this isn't the mark mm-hmm. I would want it to be. How, what, what's your internal and external process for that? So there's a couple of things. One is um, if I'm really taking care of my employees, I would not put them in a situation where something would go in external <laughs> okay. before I see it, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that if I had feedback to give, I would give that and I would, I would coach them prior to it going externally. So it would not be a reflection in any way um, of that person or the business uh, in a way that, would not represent what I'm standing for. Um, I also would, um, if anything were to go external, right, without, say, for some reason, if I didn't see it. First, as a leader, I would always take accountability for my part of it because if if something's going past you as a leader and you are going to blame it on somebody else, you really have to be looking at yourself and what your role is in that um, because – whatever process you have in place or whatever system, and it doesn't have to be even like your eyes that have to see it, or, you know, it could be somebody who's a trusted advisor that their role is to like protect the brand of the company. Um, and, and and obviously in a small business, there's only so many people that can do that. Right. So you, as the owner, you probably have to do that. And as the owner, you're going to see it better than anyone else. You know, you're going to know what your brand is, but my commitment to my employees would always be, I'm going to make sure whatever you do is successful. And therefore, I want you to always feel safe coming to me to share what you have. And we're going to go through it together. And I will coach you through whatever it is that needs to be uh, edited or changed. I will do that with compassion. And I will not do that in in judgment in any way. uh, Because I want you to learn, I want you to grow, and I don't want you to be discouraged, and I don't want you to feel like a typo or any little thing, which Kim knows typos make me crazy (laughs) for my own issues, not because of anyone else, but it's because of, you know, like, I, we have, like, I just want to support you in feeling proud about your work, and if I'm not there to, like, check and to coach you, then I'm not doing my job. Got it. So, I, I'm almost starting at the wrong point. If I'm talking about the end result, it's like we have to go way back through the whole process and there's self-reflection Absolutely. going on there for that whole time. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think there's remembering too, one of the things that we talked about a lot is this stuff isn't life and death. In the float world, same is true. This stuff isn't life and death. And so, yes, it can have an impact, but for the, like the most part, everything can be fixed. If somebody mm-hmm. says the wrong thing to a, a mm-hmm. guest, you can call that guest and say, hey, I think there was some, you know, misunderstanding earlier and Absolutely. I just want to call and clear the air with you and, you know, talk about what mm-hmm. happened. Like we can pretty much fix anything, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. It might be comping a session. It might be, you know, inviting somebody to come back in. Like there are lots of solutions to, you know, things that happen. But as small business owners, especially, we have such tight grips on our businesses and we want everything, um, again, perfectionist hat on. We want everything to be perfect. And just remembering this isn't life and death. And if something doesn't go the right way, we can fix it, whatever it is. Yeah. And with that too, Kim, I would say that Mm -hmm. most every customer also just wants to be heard. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's not even about um, telling them that you're going to comp a a session, Mm -hmm. right? It's about saying, I understand how you feel and I'm sorry that you feel that way. Mm -hmm. Or I apologize that you feel that way. And is there something that I can do to help you feel that the next time, you know, it'll be, it, it's, it's really about emotional intelligence. It's really about meeting someone where they are and honoring whatever feeling they have. Love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, can I um, zoom back a little bit? Uh, if I were sure. making a movie, a biography on you two, it, it have this beautiful finale of you guys working together and you're improving <laughs> the business and uh, you're so happy in what you're doing. But at the same time, haven't you both left the corporate world? I'm curious, what is the epilogue here that is that you're now present lives? What happened when it seems like you guys were fulfilled working in what you were doing? What what were your There's, there's a huge lesson in that too. Like going back to what Drew was saying before, like, yeah, people are going to leave. Even if you love the job, if you mm-hmm. love what you're doing, life happens. And like, we all have to be prepared for that, you know, and part of our job was always to reduce onboarding time, reduce, you know, you can look at things and we've talked about on the podcast before about time to proficiency and time to productivity and, you know, looking at those sorts of things. And, but a lot of as business owners, like you just have to know life happens and like, you can still support someone 
on their way out the door. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, taking what you've learned, I think, you know, we've both done that. And I've, I've certainly taken everything I learned in the corporate world and been able to apply that to my own businesses, been able to take those lessons and, you know, offer those to the float industry as well. Um, and I think there's something really, really amazing whenever you can leave knowing you did all you could and you gave all of your heart and all of your love to that while you were there. Um, and that is a huge success, you know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, one thing I actually enjoy doing, well, I, I love coaching people, and I love helping people identify, like, what is, what's stopping them from living their dreams. And and oftentimes, you know, they're waiting for the company to tell them what the answer is for their life, and the reality is only you can choose that for yourself, right? So with Kim, with other people that have worked for me, I have been very transparent and, and asked them to be so with me. When you're ready to go, when you want something that the company can't offer you anymore, I want to do everything I can to help you be successful, like going and, and you know, and moving on. Uh, because I care about you. Your career is meaningful to me. And so it, it's important that um, we can't take it personally when people feel that they need to move on. You know, it is everybody's journey is different. And. People come into our lives for a reason, for a period of time, and then they exit. And that's going to happen with employees, you know, like, but you never know how it's going to turn out. I mean, Kim and I haven't worked together in years, or I was talking to an employee recently who, you know, she had an employee years ago who's now going to donate a kidney to her husband because, you know, she meant so much to her when she worked for her, right? And that's years gone by, but it's that kind of relationship that you can create with the people that you work with. And the, the, what's really important to remember about employees that leave you, they also contribute to your reputation and they also contribute to your story of who you are mm -hmm. and how they feel when they leave matters. You know, so the employee experience from day one through the whole thing is a reflection of your business. And I don't think it matters what size your business is. If you show that you care and you take care of them like genuinely, and it doesn't mean you have to pay the highest salary. It doesn't mean you have to give them everything. It doesn't mean that you have to like make a schedule that only works for them and not you. It it means like you're open to having conversation. You're open to listening. You're open to allowing that person to be who they are so that they feel safe and comfortable and they can give them best, their best self. Mm -hmm. The outcome will always be positive. I promise you. <laughs> nice. I and I think, that. you know, giving people that platform to, openly and honestly express um, what motivates them. Mm -hmm. You know, what, uh, how do you like to be recognized? You know, I have two new employees who just started um, at our float center today. And that was part of our discussion. We had a team lunch. Like it wasn't a heavy, heavy work day. It was like, here's a little bit about our mission, what we do, how we operate, how we like show up in the world and what we're hoping you're contributing. And we want to hear more from you about what you think you can contribute beyond just the tackle, you know, the task list that we do every day. Mm -hmm. But I also like have a form that I ask them to fill out that it's getting to know you. It's like, you know, how do you like to be recognized? What mm -hmm. situations should we avoid in recognizing you? What makes you uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Because not everybody wants to be recognized in the same way and recognizing each person is so unique and mm -hmm. giving them the opportunity to, and they may not know, you know, one of our employees is in this, in the middle of kind of this life um, moment of trying to really figure out who she is. And, and she shared with me when I've asked her some questions, she's like, I don't know the answer to that. And I've told her like, that's okay. When you do feel confident in your answer, I'm still here and I would still love to hear it. But for now, just as we do things and as we move through this together, keep me posted. Like if I do something that makes you uncomfortable or if I do something that you really enjoy and appreciate, I would love that feedback as well so that we know to continue to, you know, encourage you and support you in this way. Um, but mm -hmm. giving, just asking like, what do you like? How do you like to be recognized? Some people hate recognition on their birthdays. And if you throw a big hoopla and, you know, announce that it's their birthday and you have balloons everywhere and they want to hide under their desk, like, that's such an easy thing to avoid by just having a conversation up front and saying, like, tell me, just tell me. It, yeah. And I, I would say, Kim, to add to that, the other part of that conversation is like, so what happens to you when you're in conflict? What happens mm -hmm. with you when mm -hmm. something is wrong? Like, how do you mm -hmm. uh, how do you behave? Like, mm -hmm. like, do you shut down? Do you withdraw? Do you get angry? Do you lash out? You know, and knowing that. And so. Again, when you're managing people or when you're in any kind of relationship, mm -hmm. having those conversations when you're not in conflict to say, 
okay, we're going to have it no matter what. It's just part of human life, right? We're going to have times we don't agree. What is What are the things we want to be careful of? Or what are the things that I can do to help you feel more comfortable when I have to say, Kim, you know, you've done this <laughs> and it's not working for me or mm-hmm. something you've done. You know, and, and I think we always had a way of communicating with each other where no, nobody felt threatened ever. Mm-hmm. I think it was just a way of saying, we're going to agree that when we talk to each other during conflict, we're going to have respect. We're going to be mindful of the other person's like feeling and heart. And um, we can always find a solution because the, you know, we care, we care about each other. This is my favorite, least favorite type of show, which is <laughs> I am so in love with what you're talking about. I'm so engaged and we don't have the time to go into everything, which means Olga, producer Olga, if you're listening uh, and I'll message you, we need to have Carolyn, if she's willing to come oh, back on. I would love to come back. I would ASAP. Come back. I, would, I would love to talk with you more about There's, some more. Yes. I do have to finish. You asked why leaving corporate America, you know, why for me as well. But I think, you know, when you're, when you're um, in corporate America, you can't always do the things that you feel are what's best because you are in an organization where there's a lot of other people pulling the levers. Right. And so I, I've decided I I would rather be in a position where I can help coach people and businesses to help create great employee experiences that help the business be most successful. So the, I promise you, if you make your employees happy and you create an, ex, an experience for employees where they feel like they're cared for and engaged, the business will always profit. It's always because they will carry that forward to the customer. It happens every single time. There's a lot of research on it. I want to put my energy toward making that happen in various aspects of the world and not so much anymore in one company Hmm. there's too much opportunity around the world so i'd rather help owners and people Mm -hmm. you know create that everywhere would that involve float center owners as well i would love to anything i could do with you carolyn yeah so i uh, kim can give my uh email address and um in the show notes yeah, yeah in the show notes and um yeah, I'm getting all my business going, but anything I could do to help support, I'm happy to consult, I'm happy to coach, anything I could do for any of the float owners to um, even have a conversation about what you can do, um, I, I will be there and I will support you. Thank you so much. Uh, my would, pleasure. Would the email that I should put out there be the same one we used for scheduling this? I think so. Yeah, Carolyn J. Bruce at gmail.com. And it's Carolyn with two ends. My parents wanted me to be different. So it's too <laughs> and different you and they are. Succeeded. Yeah, that's great. Mission accomplished. And, and Kim, I will just so you say that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I will just say, like, I honestly don't think I would be where I am today and I would own a float center if I did not work for her. She Aww. was one of those leaders who just really encouraged and empowered me to be myself and to offer my unique gifts to the company. Um, and I think in doing that, she really helped me to uncover like who I wanted to be and how I wanted to show up in the world. And I gave as much as I could to the company before it was my time to leave. Mm -hmm. And then to feel comfortable and confident, like walking in to open up this business in this industry that I really didn't know a ton about, um, and to do the research and then, you know, start to get to know people and network and all of that. But to be able to recognize I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I ever would have been in that place had I not worked for Carolyn, like, Oh, at all no. yeah well you always had it in you like my job was always to pull it out and to help you see that you are so creative you're so uh on top of everything and you can make whatever you want to put your mind to you can make happen and and you always did i think it was the help helping to build your confidence that you could mm-hmm. and that was my greatest joy is to see that happen and to watch what's happened since is like i just feel giddy it's so it <laughs> makes me happy <laughs> And I mean, what a great leader. The fact that here we are years later, we haven't actually worked on the same team together. And I don't know, has it been 10 years now? Um, it's It's been a long time and we've stayed in each other's lives in, in some capacity, not as close as we used to be because it's life. Um, but to be able to show up and whenever I called and said, hey, Carolyn, I really would love to have you come on and talk about leadership and share what you know, you know, with the float world she was willing to do that for us, you know, and that again, just goes back to like caring for individuals and you just never know where that's going to take you in life, you know, (laughs) like 
You just never totally know. Totally agree. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you Carolyn, for being you, here and you are very sharing your pleasure. Carolyn. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. Thanks to my co-hosts for being here tonight. Oh, I should mention Gloria won't be on the podcast tonight and <laughs> always keeping her professional. And um, thanks to you for listening. Thank you so much for putting uh, your earbuds in and, and hearing what we have to, to share and especially tonight uh, what Carolyn had to share. And uh, I truly, honestly want you back on as soon as possible, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who um, is supporting us on Patreon. We truly appreciate that. Um, of course, we're trying to give all sorts of rewards for our Patreon subscribers, primarily photography and video clips, as well as scientific blog posts, depending on your tier. Uh, we also have a storefront now, shop.artofthefloat.com as well. For previous uh, photography, video sets, testimonial videos, t-shirts, mugs, all that good stuff. Um, But also a big shout out to our sponsors. Thank you guys for making sure that we can do this each and every week. Thank you so much to Helmbot. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much to Isopod for supporting us. Truly appreciate it. And thank you so much to Mindful Solutions. That's mindful with two L's dot solutions. Thank you so much for supporting the show and supporting our businesses (laughs) in such an authentic way. I think the only other one is the most important of all. Thank you, Olga, for producing the show. And to everybody else, thank you so much. Um, Let's see here. Um, As always, be your authentic self. We'll see you next week.